Welcome to the latest episode of the Catalyst Health, Wellness, and Performance Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Bradford Cooper, and today we're interviewing my treadmill running coach. Now, if that doesn't get you too excited, let me, let me describe her a little bit differently. She's also the three-time Ironman world champion and the 70.3 world champion. Her name, Marinda Rennie Carfrey. Now, how did I get so lucky to have her as my treadmill running coach? Well, that might be a little bit of an exaggeration. She's, she's not just my coach, but in addition to being the four-time world champion, she's the most feared runner in the sport, usually beating most of the men in the marathon portion of the Ironman in addition to all the women. If you've ever seen her run, you know it's more of a glide than a run. She's so smooth that all I have to do, and I'm not kidding on this at all, all I have to do to improve my running is to pop on one of her races on the TV above our treadmill, and my run just smooths out. You just get faster. So maybe she's not my personal treadmill coach, but she definitely has an impact. Seriously, though, Rennie is an incredible athlete, but she's also a pretty incredible person, one of the most loved on the triathlon circuit. And while she's a champion through and through, she's also been through a number of significant life changes in the past few years, including the birth of her daughter, Isabella. We talk about sport, life, and what's next in today's episode. If you weren't a Rennie fan before, you will be when this is done. Now, if you're planning to pursue your coaching certification before the national board requirements change, you'll want to get registered ASAP. Our May at-home certification filled to capacity almost a month early, and our June event is just around the corner. It's June 13th. If you'd like more information or you just want to talk about it, you just want to find out more about what coaching certification might mean for your career, feel free to reach out to us anytime. Results at catalystcoachinginstitute.com, and we're happy to set up some time to talk about your situation, different options, that kind of thing. Now, let's jump in with four-time world champion Rennie Carfrey on the latest episode of the Catalyst Health, Wellness, and Performance Podcast. Well, it is definitely my pleasure today to welcome Marinda Rennie Carfrey. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me on. What I'd like to do today is is go beyond the typical swim bike run, but before we do that, we got to go back to 2014. I mean, when when you yeah. came off the bike, 14 minutes down, you ran a 250 marathon, you got the win. That had to be one of the most exciting performances I've ever seen in any sport. Can you can you talk us through the day? I know you've been asked this a million times, but can you give us some insights into what was happening and what was going on that day? Yeah, of course. Um... Yeah, definitely a, a a race people like to talk about a lot. Um, that race um, was 2014. I was actually defending champ, so I won in 2013. And mm-hmm. I believe 2013 was my best ever performance. But going into 14, you know, when you're a world champion, you have a lot of extra obligations. Um, you know, the crown can be heavy. Um, you know, it's a welcome. <laughs> it's always welcome to have that, um, that oh, sure. extra pressure and all of those things. But, you know, it, it is... Um, it takes away from what your number one focus is, and that is to be the best athlete that you can be. Um, and for me, it's always been, you know, to see how fast I can go in Kona. And yeah, after winning in 13, um, yeah, you just have, you know, you have more sponsors, which is fantastic, but that means you have more appearances <laughs> and you have more interviews and you have more, um, you know, more of everything. Life is just a bit busier. Uh, right. So um, it takes a little bit of the energy away from what your main focus is, and that is to, you know, train um, and, and prepare for the big race again. So going into 14, um, you know, I, I was in fantastic shape, great shape. Uh, we prepared very well again. Um, but I I had a very good swim. I didn't bike as well as I had hoped to bike. Um, and, you know, hence getting off the bike 13 or 14 minutes down off the lead. Um, for me, mentally, that was really tough because I felt pretty um, disappointed in myself. I felt like I kind of, you know, I think I was about eighth off the bike. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, 14 minutes behind the leader. uh, And I just was like, this is embarrassing. I'm, you know, the defending world champion and I'm getting absolutely slaughtered here. Um, And so, you know, hopping off the bike the first mile or so, I was just like, you know, why am I even racing? Like, you know, why finish? What's the point in racing? I'm so far back. I can't even get you know, get a, I'm not going to have a good performance today. I had all of those negative thoughts. Um, 
And then, you know, early in the run, I saw my, my coach, Siri Lindley, um, and she was kind of like, you know, if anyone knows, uh, Siri Lindley, she's <laughs> a larger than life personality, just yeah, yeah. Um, bouncing off the walls. Um, and she was kind of crouched down like a tiger and she was just like yelled at me, you are in the perfect position. And I was just like, what is this woman talking what about? What race like, are you watching? Yeah, like seriously, serious, I just was, could, it kind of shook my head like, oh my God, she's crazy. And, like, and where was she? Was this like mile way. three? Was this a, No, a no, this was in the first mile. Like okay. in the first mile. Right like, as you go up the hill you know, and take a right? Yeah, go. Yeah, first um, up the hill, take a right um, before you even get down onto Elite Drive for the um, long out and back on Elite Drive. And I was kind of like, she is crazy. And, you know, I <laughs> kind of laughed to myself for, for a minute there. And then, but then I kind of got back into my mindset, okay, well, I'm here. I know I've prepared well. I know I looked after myself well on the bike in terms of, you know, hydrating and, and um, taking on um, as much nutrition as I could, like, I'm going to try and put together the best marathon I possibly can. And I sh- kind of shifted my goal to uh, you're a failure. You're not going to win this race to let's try and get in the top five, like top five of the world champs is still a, a great result. And so that became my goal for the first, um, for the first half of the marathon. And uh, fortunately I got to about mile 13, around half halfway in the marathon and uh, places um, third, fourth and fifth were all running together. Mm. And so I caught, picked off those three girls like within half a mile. And so my goal of getting, you know, top five, um, I was now running in third place. And so all of a sudden I was feeling super positive and like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to be back on the podium. This is, this is great. Um, uh, exceeding my first goal. And then of course, you know, goal shifted again. And my next goal was to, okay, let's see if I can pick off second place. And, you know, a few miles later, I think down in the energy lab, I think Rachel Joyce was in second place, uh, who's, a, who's a good friend of mine. Um, I, I caught up to Rachel and went past Rachel. Um, and I'm like, okay, this is great. I'm, I'm feeling great. I'm running well. Um, my cadence is good. I'm um, still, still feel like I have some good energy. Um, and I was kind of coming back onto the, um, to the Queen K at that point. And, um, I was like, okay, let's see if, let's see what we got. Like, let's see what I can do for this last, like, you know, nine, 10 miles, uh, maybe less than that, probably more like, uh, eight miles of the race. And, um, the cool thing when you're racing Kona is that, you know, there's a lot of media around, there's helicopters in the sky, there's, um, motorbikes and motorcade around the leader. And so from very far away, I could see the the leader because of (laughs) the um you know the lead car and the uh, motorcycle surrounding her and so um yeah I'm like okay well there's a visual on the leader and of course you know the Queen K is just a dead straight highway um and not much else going on out there uh so yeah that became my number one focus and I just honed in on on Daniela who was then leading the race and um slowly but surely picked her off at about uh, 5k to go and yeah um that was pretty special getting to run back you know down Polani I think I caught her right before you head there's this slight hill up to Polani and then Polani's a big downhill before you kind of make a left and then a right and then a right onto the famous Elite Drive finish shoot uh so I had like you know that last two miles or so to kind of soak it up and enjoy um you know i mean i had to make sure i <laughs> passed daniela convincingly and put her in my rear view mirror um and i tried to do that as quickly as possible so i could soak up the atmosphere of the last couple of miles because yeah there's no there's no nothing like it um running down a lee drive in first place is a pretty magical experience not something that you know i can articulate very well but um it is incredible getting to to run down there and that, yeah that was for my third time so very special. And yeah, I think that was my first, that's still my fastest ever marathon in Kona, um, low 250s. And third overall of all the men as well. Yeah, yeah, that's that's right. Um, we, uh, we went a fair amount faster than some of the boys. <laughs> <laughs> you kicked their butts my husband just, you did. My husband just this year beat my run time. Um, I saw that. Year. I saw that. He, he, I'm sure he had that on his target for a long time. I got to beat my yeah. wife one of these days. Yeah. Oh, I think he great. was pretty happy to see that, that's see that awesome. split at the finish. 
Well, so much depth into what you talked about. You talked about early on Siri being there. What, what do you think would have happened had she not been there? What was the impact of that encouragement that early in the race? Or maybe it wasn't even the encouragement. It was more the, the humor, the wake up call, like the, are you kidding me? And then you started smiling, you said, and then you started reflecting. What, what, did you just need something to, to break that negative self-talk that was happening? You know, I, I don't know if it, it's hard for me to sit here now and say whether sure. it made a difference or not. Um, certainly, it was, it's always been fantastic to have her support on race day on the course. Um, but honestly, I, I've, you know, I've done many, many races um, with Siri there, without Siri there. And um, I've always been able to turn negative thoughts into, into positive ones or, or change my um, goals. And so I think it was just a, more a matter of time of like settling into the marathon and just like, you know, <laughs> giving myself a talking to and then, um, you know, getting back in the game. Uh, but yeah, I mean, having her there that early was, um, and so confident that I was in the perfect position because, you know, <laughs> we, the perfect position was to win the race. Um, so, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, yeah, I mean, I can't really say one way or another whether that changed it. I, knowing myself, tend to think that I probably would have turned right. things around regardless. Mm -hmm. I mean, there was no way I would, you know, give in any day of the week. So, uh, but yeah, always having her there was a just an extra boost, I, I guess you'd say. Well, the other thing you talked about was something we call segmenting when we're talking about functional mental toughness, but you broke it into pieces. You, you didn't say, okay, I'm 14 down. I need, you know, 45 seconds per mile. You, know, you didn't do any of that. You said, let's go for fifth. And then you got there and you said, okay, let's, let's get second. Let's get Rachel. And, and, and now where's the helicopter? Have you always done that? Is that something that's just been an ongoing strategy, especially since you're such a good runner and you're always pretty much always coming from behind like that? Uh, yeah, I mean, my whole career, I'm not the best swimmer, that's no secret. Um, so my whole career, I've always sort of, um, I never get to lead the race until the very end, <laughs> if I'm Good lucky or if I, you know, I have my day. But I, I always get onto the run and try to put together, execute my fastest run. And I'm all, I was always trying to break, you know, my record from last year or go faster than I'd ever gone before. And so there was no different this year um but i think in the years prior i was more focused on running a certain time or like mm. holding a certain pace whereas this year i sort of threw pacing you know not i didn't throw it out the window because obviously i wasn't going to just you know run sure. a 116 first half right. I, I you know i needed to be smart about my pacing but i was more focused on uh just positioning and um making it to the top five and then obviously you know through um up to the up to the front and you know shifting my goal as the race went but yeah i think i've in the past i've had most success with um just focusing on my pacing and knowing what my end goal is and you know exactly what time i want to run um i don't I, i've never really sort of broken it down and figured out exactly how many seconds i need to run faster mm. per mile to catch the um next girl because I, I think that can mess you up if they, you know, they all of a sudden speed up and you've dropped, you know, 15 seconds or 20 seconds quicker a mile. Maybe they've sped up 20 seconds quicker a mile. I think the best way to your best result is to focus on trying to run your best time, um, wow. you know, a bike or swim your best time. And a lot of the time, and certainly most of my, a lot of my career, it's, it's ended up with a really great result in the end. Um, just, yeah, just focusing on, what you can do and not trying to um, run however much time faster to catch uh, that leader or whatever place you're trying to uh, position into. That's good advice. We, we have a lot of folks listening that aren't triathletes and that I love what you're saying there because it's so applicable, not just to triathlon or, or marathons, but to life. You stop worrying about what the other people are doing, focus on what you can do, optimizing what you can do and more often than not, good things happen. So, very cool. Great way to start. So that was your third world championship. You won in 2010, 2013. Do you think that history, it, it, you kind of referenced this as you were talking about it, but do you think that history of being the champion, the two-time champion at that point, had a big impact on what was going on between the ears during that 2014 race? Oh, certainly. I think, you know, you, um, 
learn how to, I mean, my you know, first year racing Kona, my second year, you know, I won in 2010, but I was still learning how to race the Ironman. And um, I feel like by 13, by 14, I really knew how to pace well. I knew what it felt like um, to be right on that, you know, perfect, um, comfortable, uncomfortable feeling of, of, of racing, um, just going exactly as fast as, <laughs> as you can without mm-hmm. blowing up um, or, or a pace that you can sustain. And I think, yeah, the first few years, definitely learning how to do that. Um, I never really had too much more. Well, one year I had trouble with nutrition, but I, I always had a pretty good nutrition plan and, um, and stuck to that. And obviously, you know, the longer you go in races, um, Mar- whether it be marathon, uh, ultra, um, Ironman trap, any triathlons, nutrition becomes a major factor. Huge. And Huge. Um, that has been something that I've been able to dial in and I was able to dial in early in my career. So it, more of the focus just came to like learning how to race um, and just, you know, the years and the years of consistent training. Uh, I think that is really more than anything else, the consistent training over the years, um, being healthy, not getting injured, not having any breaks really, unless they were scheduled uh, through my whole career. And that's why I've been able to progress um, and have um, better performances year after year to a point. Now, that sure, <laughs> until sure. I had Izzy, then I have a little <laughs> bit of a down, down phase. <laughs> sure, sure. No, that's understandable. All right. So you've joked about your swim being yeah, not quite where you're, you'd love it to be. And and your run is frankly, and I told you before we hit record, I, I've never seen a more beautiful run. I would literally, folks, if you want to get better as a runner, pop on one of Rennie's races on the TV in front of the treadmill and start running and you'll just automatically start running better. It's amazing. But so you have this incredible gap with swimming and this incredible gift with running. We all have that in, in whatever we do. Are there lessons you've learned from having such a, in your case, public gap slash strength that our listeners could take into their own lives, maybe outside the sport, how you've dealt with that? Yeah, I think, um, I think when people look at uh, triathlon uh, and specifically, you know, if you're a great swimmer or a great runner, um, the common theme is to just focus on your weakness. And I don't believe that's necessarily the best way to approach um, anything. I think Mm. you have to look after your strength that is something that you've been gifted. You should always take care of your strength. Um, you know, that's not to say that you work on your weakness and you, you know, spend a little bit of time sure. where possible, but you never sacrifice your gift. You never sacrifice um, that strength. And um, yeah, we, I, you know, I've had many people over the years say, oh, you, you should just stop, you know, stop running, run half the run volume and focus on your bike and your, and your swim. And, you know, <laughs> you'll be fine. You'll just, you'll just run just, just as fast. And I don't believe that's, true um and uh, along with that i think running off of much less volume and less run fitness would be a miserable marathon Um, maybe i'd be able to run a decent time probably a few minutes slower but it would be miserable um so yeah i mean i always sort of learn what you're really good at or figure out what you are talented at or have a gift um, and always look after that gift you can work on weaknesses and try and make those other areas in your life better. But I, I think you should make sure you take care of the gift always. Love it. Love it. All right. In other interviews I listened to, you mentioned that you, you really do a good job of appreciating your wins, soaking in those accomplishments rather than just the race is over, you get your trophy and okay, you default to, okay, what's next? What do I got to do next? <laughs> Time to start training again. That's pretty unique among world-class performers. H- has that been natural to you or is it something you've learned over time where you you struggle with the other end of the spectrum or any tips for those of us who and i'm including this struggle to remember the whole idea that life is now let's enjoy the now instead of life is next yeah no i think um i don't know early in my career i um kind of started realizing that you need to focus you need to celebrate the victories um the, the small ones and the big ones along the way um, otherwise it's going to be a miserable long road and mm. you could always be better. Like you win a world title, be the best in the world. And, you know, we're all type A, we're all perfectionists. Yeah. But there could have been areas in the race that you could fix. You could always nitpick over those things. But I think the best way to enjoy this journey is to, um, 
just stop for a minute and, and realize what you've accomplished and, and the work that you've put in. And, um, you know, I've been doing triathlon for 20 years now, <laughs> a long time. And I think the reason I've had longevity in the sport and the reason I've had success, um, first of all, is because uh, my consistency. So it took me like 10 years of consistent training to, you know, start racing at the top level. Sure. But then always, you know, celebrating those victories and taking downtime. You know, at the end of the year, you know, my husband and I, we, uh, we like to party a little bit, <laughs> you know, like if, <laughs> if we have a good race, if we have a bad race, you know, like you've spent your whole year trying to prepare for this one event right. and we work extremely hard, um, year, day in, day out, year in, year out. And, um, you know, if you have a great race on that day, then it's something to be celebrated. If you have a bad race, you know, maybe it's just time to have a mental break. Um, give yourself a break, um, take some time out and, and then start the process again. Um, it is very hard to to switch off like that. And we sort of give ourselves, especially if we haven't had a good race, a day or two to reflect and to write down our thoughts and to um, figure out exactly what we think we need to do differently to um, prepare better for the next year. But uh, we also then put it all away and just try to forget about triathlon and for a little bit and just spend time as a family and enjoy you know, this incredible life we get to lead. That's fantastic. That's outstanding advice. All right. You have been obviously through some pretty big life changes at the birth of your daughter, Isabella, what, three years ago, two and a half years ago? Yeah, two and a half. Is the challenge of winning Kona this year more of a physical challenge or more of a logistical challenge with the growing family? This year, I think it probably is a little bit more of a logistical challenge. The last two years uh, was a physical challenge. It's certainly the year after she was born, um, trying to come back, to come back after oh, yeah. having a baby is is rough. It's hard, <laughs> definitely hard work. But um, I, you know, I, I'm really proud of um, the performances I had the last couple of years. Obviously, last year I had huge hopes for Kona and um, actually raced as well as, if not better, than I ever have over the half distances throughout the year. And then, unfortunately, five weeks out from Kona, broke my arm, mm. which is completely random because I haven't broken a bone since I was about five years old. So wow. um, that was just a huge bummer. And um, yeah, that kind of set things set things off um, and wasn't able to complete the race in Kona last year. So that's kind of a sore spot for me. Uh, but this year I feel physically like, you know, I have all the tools I need to perform well or to, to perform at the highest level. It's just going to be a matter of, um, you know, Izzy's older now and she wants more time with mummy and daddy. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you know, I want to spend time with her. She's my favorite person in the world. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, having her as well, traveling with her, I mean, since she was little, since she was probably eight weeks old, we traveled to Kona with her when she was um, eight weeks old and wow. she traveled a ton with us. She's a pro at travel, but it's still extra work. Um, sure. you know, like the, the logistics, um, you know, all the things that go along with having a, a small person um, to look after 24 um, seven. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's one extra um, piece to our puzzle. Uh, it's a welcome piece. So we love that um, addition to our life, but it is a lot different to prior to Izzy. It was, you know, prior to Isabel, it was purely um, training performance, you know, resting. And now it's, it is training and it is trying to be <laughs> perform at the highest level. Um, some of the recovery and rest goes to the wayside a bit because right. you, know, you get home and you just, she wants to have a dance party. So we all have a dance party. <laughs> um, so, yeah, but I don't know. I feel like she gives us a lot of energy and I don't know if I would, be, you know, if I didn't have that, I don't want to call it a distraction, but that addition to our lives, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I'd be loving the sport as much now. I, I think, it's been all consuming in our lives for well, 16, 16 years before we had Izzy. And so it's just nice to have other things in life. Yeah. I think sometimes it's good to complicate your life a little bit and memories of having her at races uh, are going to be far great, you know, far oh. more meaning than, you know, prior to having her and our family together at races. So yeah, uh, it's just enriched our lives that much more. Love it. Love it. All right. You've mentioned, I heard an interview you were talking about, you 
try to stay away from people with negative energy. And I love that. I think the, the research bears out the importance of us doing that. Can you talk us through why you've made that a habit and maybe tips for people that are thinking, I maybe need to do that in my own life? <laughs> yeah, and I just um, have always sensed, you know, the energy from people or around people. And, and I feel like everyone kind of has an idea of someone who is uplifting. Um, I don't I don't know if this came from Siri or if it's something I've learned from her because I know she's, you know, obviously she's a very positive person, very uplifting person. But I just, I just don't have time for negativity. I don't have time for anyone who's, you know, just not my, of my kind of mindset, I sure. guess you'd say. Yeah. Um, I, if someone's not, you know, a help, they're a hindrance. Um, and that's not, you know, obviously friendships go both ways. I have, sure. you know, some amazing friendships, but I generally tend to not become friends with people who I feel are just a different or a more negative mindset or a negative personality. Um, I kind of just, you know, steer the other way or <laughs> go a different direction to, to people like that. And I, I think I've just always been like that. Um, I kind of get a sense for someone and pretty quickly know whether I like them or not. And I've been wrong before, actually, will admit that. I um, met a person again later. Oh, maybe that, you know, that changed their personality a little bit or uh, had a negative mindset when I first met them and become more positive. But um, yeah, I mean, I just, I just don't have time for that in my life. I, I welcome uh, positivity. I welcome um, people who are just uh, a similar mindset, I guess you'd say. Well, and you got to have that. You, like you said, you don't have time for the, the drama. No, no drama. <laughs> no drama allowed in our house. And I think also it's just, it takes your energy. It sucks your energy. If you're around somebody who's a little bit negative or mm -hmm. a little bit um, just down, it's it's draining. And I, <laughs> I mean, you know, the amount of training we do. And uh, I mean, no one really has time for that. No one has the energy <laughs> for that. And right. I, I certainly you know, don't have the energy. I, I have energy for tra training. I have energy for my family and for my good friends. And if if anyone wants to be involved in that energy and, and be a part of that, that's that's fantastic. But don't bring your negativity around our house. It doesn't fit in here. <laughs> Love it. Love it. All right. We're going to take a sideline for treadmills here for a second. Tre people love to call them dreadmills and get, you know, bad rap. I I've always thought they're a great chance. I, I don't, I don't love, I don't look forward to the treadmill consistently, but I've always thought they're, they're a great chance to work on your cadence, your foot speed, that kind of stuff. So you, you caught my attention when you mentioned that in an interview with, with Greg Bennett that you did recently. Can you share a little more about this concept for those who might see treadmill as this thing to be avoided at all costs? Some of the benefits that you see from some, one of the greatest runners we've ever seen. I love the treadmill. I'm, I'm a big fan and, uh, I really only started, Siri Lindley was the one who sort of incorporated into our training uh, probably in 2005, 2006, and we would do one hard run a week on the treadmill. And as you mentioned, it's a really great tool for working on your cadence. And I think the, one of the reasons I am able to execute fast marathons is my cadence. I'm not a tall person. I'm only 5'3". So working on turnover and cadence uh, it's just much easier when you're on the treadmill because it kind of pulls your legs through. Mm -hmm. The other thing I love about the treadmill is I feel like when you're out on the road, sometimes you start out a little fast and you, you slow down through an interval or through, slow down through a session. On the treadmill, you can't slow down. You put it at a pace and you have to keep up with the treadmill. And so, yeah, like some days it is really tough to do that. But over time, um, you start to master some of those sessions and and for us like key sessions have been like 15 by three minutes 20 by three minutes these mm -hmm. are big big run sessions and only well, I would only do these run sessions when I'm in really good shape and you know able to uh, recover well from them but sessions like that and then build runs where you sort of do 20 minutes at sort of a little bit slower than Ironman pace 20 minutes at Ironman pace and 20 minutes above and finishing as fast as you can uh, they're kind of my bread and butter workouts on the treadmill and been doing them for <laughs> over 10 years now. Mm. And I, I think they definitely play a big role in, in my progression as a runner over the years. All right, everybody, did you hear that? You want to run like Rennie? 
get on the treadmill. All right. So how have you applied, let's pull triathlon lessons into other aspects of life. How have you applied the lesson? You've been doing this for, I think you said 20 years. How have you applied the lessons you've learned from triathlon to other areas of your life? Or how do you think those lessons will benefit you over the next, let's say 40 years? Well, I think um, as a professional athlete, you're, and as you get more successful as a professional athlete, you're basically running your own business. Um, So Mm -hmm. aside from, you know, the discipline that you have, you need to have the mental strength you need to have and those things that will help you in later life, you're also learning how to run your own business. Um, And so, yeah, I think there are a lot of tools that I have learnt or have um, honed over the years um, racing triathlons, not to mention the travel that we've, you know, done with the sport. Talk about opening your mind, um, being able to travel the world. Oh yeah. Um, definitely opens your mind to different circumstances, different cultures, different outlooks, different beliefs. Uh, and you know, I wish more people could travel because I feel like that would change things, um, mm. in this world. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I think, yeah, this, this sport has given me so many wonderful gifts that I will benefit from for the rest of my life. And, you know, the core key ones are, you know, that mental strength, um, positive attitude, goal setting, um, making a plan, having goals and making a plan and and finding a way to get to those goals. All of those things I think are just important in in everyday life. What are your goals in life? What do you want your life to look like? What, what do you want to, where do you want to live? What do you want to do? Figuring all of that out and then, making a plan or a roadmap to get there. They are fundamental in a successful, a successful life. It's interesting. It, it sounds so basic to hear you say that. And yet you're right. Those are the basics that most people skip over and they're just, they can't figure out, well, wh- wh- why isn't my life going the way I want it to? Well, l- look at what Rennie's doing with her triathlon and mimic that in anyway. Well said. Yeah. Well said. It can be very, it can be, it, it, you know, obviously it, it, you can complicate it as much as you like, but, um, yeah, you can also simplify it and just f- figure out what you want, write it down, and then believe it, feel it, and then figure out that roadmap. Yeah, take those steps. Take those steps. All right, 2012, tough year at Kona. You had to battle through some s- tough, tough stuff that year, but you still finished on the podium. When I've heard you talk about that year, there's almost a gleam in your eye. It- it's almost as if that experience became this buoy for you as you went forward into 13 and then you went back to back 13, 14 with the world championship. Can you talk us through 2012? What happened there? Why, why the gleam in your eye for a year that was just brutal compared to anybody yeah. else's standard? You say, again, you still finished third, but compared to most people's standards, you were, you were disappointed with your finish and yet you weren't, you were almost pumped up from that year. Can you talk us through that a little bit? Yeah. Um, 2012 was like, I still look back on that year and I'm like, I'm in this two, I have two minds and that, you know, one is that I had that race in my hand and I, I messed up and that is why I didn't win. But on the other hand, I had a massive blow up. I was running on zero for probably half the last half marathon and still finished on the podium. And so the anger at myself for making, you know, some silly mistakes on the bike, what actually happened was the first mile of the bike, one of my nutrition bottles um, ejected at the back of my, mm. underneath my saddle. There's like a, a train track you ride over mm-hmm. the start of the bike and lost that nutrition. And I didn't have a plan B in place. You know, obviously I knew I could get calories out on the course, but you know, I was, I try not to use any of the on course sure. nutrition. I've always been self catered. But I didn't know, like, how many Gatorades did I need to have? How many extra gels from the course did I need to have? Uh, Because that bottle was really um, nutrition for about two hours of the bike. Mm. And so I had to kind of guess. And I didn't do a good job of guessing. I think actually, in fact, I probably took on enough calories. But then my focus was calories and I didn't take on enough, like, hydration. Mm. So I was, I just completely dehydrated myself. And when you have too many calories and don't, drink enough um, H2O, basically everything just gets stuck in your stomach and nothing goes into your muscles. You you need uh, water to help um, the carbohydrates be processed in your gut to 
uh, fuel your muscles. And I got to halfway on that marathon. I was like a meter behind Leander Cave, who was the eventual winner. Um, I was probably, I don't even know how many minutes behind her off the bike, but halfway through the marathon, I'd caught up to her. All of a sudden, everything just started to cramp up. Mm. I felt like my cars were just rocks. I couldn't even, like they just locked down, cramped. And so that was a painful last 10 or 11 or 12 miles, just like trying to <laughs> make it to the finish line. I just wanted that race to be over. I ran about a 3.05 marathon, which was my worst um, marathon, and finished third. And I was bitterly disappointed on the day, but I think that was the catalyst to the 13 and 14 victories because, you know, knowing, first of all, I completely screwed up and still finished on the podium, that gives you a lot of confidence. And secondly, having that hunger and knowing that mm. I messed up. So I went, you know, into 13, very focused and, 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 uh, you know, not to mention, I actually had left Siri Lindley for a year and a half. Uh, we sort of had a little break <laughs> in our relationship. I went and worked with someone more specifically to focus on my biking for a year or a year and a half. And I came back to Siri in the middle of 2013. And that was also another reason I think um, that I raced so well in 13 and 14. We kind of got the, got the band back together and um <laughs> I was able to, you know, put together, I think, my best ever performance in 2013. Wow. Very cool. All right. A couple more. Vision for your life 20 years from now. The world championships are in the rearview mirror. Your daughter's all growing up. What's Rennie Carfrey doing at that point? Have you, have you gotten to that point where you're starting to think about a vision 20 years from now? Or right now, is it all about October of 2020? Yeah, you know, I kind of, I sometimes start thinking about it, but I actually don't know yet. I feel like because I'm still so involved in triathlon and I'm still uh, motivated and still enjoying the sport that I, I can't really look beyond mm -hmm. um, and can't really like fully invest myself in anything beyond uh, what we're doing right now. But yeah, I mean, I mean I'm excited for the future. Uh, you know, I'm 38 now. If, uh, i plan to race for a few more years, three, four more years. If I, if my body's willing, uh, I feel like my mind will be willing because uh, I, you know, I still love racing, but um, beyond triathlon, I mean, the immediate thought is maybe to do some coaching. I feel like I would, you know, enjoy doing a little bit of triathlon coaching and, and maybe running some camps. But beyond that, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really sure what, what I'm going to be passionate about next. Because, you know, you want to find something that you are, passionate about and mm -hmm. I've been passionate about triathlon and I think that's why I've been so successful as well because I, you know I love what I'm doing and you know in the next phase in life I, I have to figure out what it is that lights my fire <laughs> and when I find that then I'll be taking off on the next on the next um, train to whatever that destination will be that makes sense. Makes sense. So for those people that are sitting out there on, ah, oh, bummer, I thought she was going to give me a hint here on, on how to go about that myself. Do you have, so let, let's forget the actual vision, but do you have some ideas of how you might go about that search or that reflection or those kinds of things five, seven, eight years down the road? Yeah, I actually don't really know. I mean, obviously I, I would probably start by talking to other ex-professional athletes and mm. sort of I know a lot of athletes have had trouble. You know, you've had a, a career in one sport and now that career is over, what's next? But I, yeah, I would, I'd like to pick a couple of other professional athletes who have successfully made the jump into a career post-sports and, and see, you know, what made them choose that direction or how they figured out what they wanted to do next. Um, I mean, my immediate future would probably be parenting, uh, yes. We want to have another another baby at some point, so that will probably be my you know next five ten years um, major focus. But um, obviously that won't be the only thing in my life. So yeah, I mean I think a good place to start would be to talk to professional ex professional athletes who have successfully moved over into uh, whatever career beyond the sport. That makes sense. You reminded me of Scott Tanley's book Racing the Sunset. I think he wrote it. I don't know, maybe 10 years ago or so, but if you haven't seen that, it might be worth a, a peek at some point. I remember mm. enjoying reading that one and, and obviously coming from a triathlon background. 
Last question. Any final tips for folks that are looking to improve not their triathlon results, but their health, wellness, performance outside of triathlon specific activities? Anything you just want to throw out there that I haven't teed up with an earlier question? Good question. Um, I think just follow your bliss. So figure out what you love in life, figure out the things that uh, make you tick and um, do those things. You know, in terms of being healthy um, and fit, you've got to get out there and be active. <laughs> so find a friend or whatever to to go and work out with. But I think beyond that um, and the bigger picture is, you know, figure out what you love in life and do those things. Well said. How do folks follow you? How do they keep track of what you're up to, Rennie? Yeah, so we have um, a YouTube chan- channel. It's called The Tim and Rennie Show. And also um, you can follow me on Instagram at Marinda Carfrey. And I'm also on Facebook, um, Marinda Rennie Carfrey. Perfect. You'll find me pretty easily. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. I know you guys just got back from Australia. Why why make the move now when we have snow in Colorado instead of uh, <laughs> maybe a little bit more warmth? Good question. No, we normally actually, um, every other year we've traveled down to Australia end of January. So we've spent February, March in Australia. But Tim and I together have actually never done a Christmas in Australia. Oh. So we figured it was time we went down for Christmas. So we went down mid-December so we could have Christmas down in Australia. He could have his first um, uh, an Australian summer Christmas barbecuing on the beach. <laughs> um, and yeah, so we spent like about six six or seven weeks down in Australia. That's typically how long we stay down there. We had all of January um, to train as well. But um, yeah, we decided to come home and we've honestly barely been home since I didn't even Santa Cruz last year, which was September. So wow. uh, we, we're ready to have some time at home. Nice. Nice. Well, enjoy it. Thanks for sneaking this in. Really appreciate it. And we'll be no looking worries. for you. We'll be cheering for you this year. Yeah. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. How fun was that? Four time world champion, Rennie Carr for everyone. Thanks again for tuning in. If you enjoy the podcast, you might also enjoy our new YouTube channel. We'll have a link to it down below. Or you can simply search for Health, Wellness, and Performance Coaching Channel on YouTube to access all sorts of resources that both will help up your game as a coach or with your own personal wellness. Now, folks, let's go after better. Better for ourselves, our families, and our community. Today, today's the day. Let's do this. This is Dr. Bradford Cooper signing off. Make it a great rest of your week, and I'll speak with you soon on the next episode of the Catalyst Health, Wellness, and Performance Podcast. Mm -hmm.